Good evening. Greetings. Greetings. And thank you very much for coming. Um, James Kahn has been in business since 1985, starting his own recruitment agency in a cupboard and growing it into a global proposition with a turnover of 130 million and operations in 50 countries. He sold that in 2002 and became a student. But instead of lying on the sofa eating crisps for a year, he graduated from Harvard Business School and won two Entrepreneur of the Year awards. Next, he set up private equity firm Hamilton Bradshaw, which manages over 40 businesses. And in 2007, he was approached by the BBC to appear on Dragon's Den. He has two honorary degrees and a doctorate, has set up his own charitable foundation, has consulted with the government and many other charities, has written two books and is working on a third, and is equal 117th on the Sunday Times Rich List, with a personal fortune worth, well, let's just say, if you want to buy, borrow a tenner, ask him and not me. Not bad from a lad who left school at 16. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Carr. Well, let's start at the beginning. Seems an appropriate place, doesn't Clearly. it? Clearly. Um, how old were you when you made your first deal? Do you remember? Uh, I was, actually. I remember that very clearly. It was quite recently. I was 12. Um, my father used to, to own a, a business where he manufactured leather garments. And every now and then, I used to take one of my dad's leather jackets, and I used to wear them in school, promoting them as I paraded in the playground to make sure that somebody noticed my new leather jacket and used to sell the leather jackets in the playground. And really, from that point, I knew that I wanted to be, you know, an entrepreneur because I was making more money selling one jacket than my father gave me as pocket money for the entire month. And then I used to have to haggle with my dad to get the right price to be able to sell it in the playground. So really, at the age of 12, I knew then that for me, the destiny was to be an entrepreneur. What did, it, what did that feel like? What did it feel like to make that first deal? Can you remember? Um, I mean, any it... word that comes to mind, but I'm not sure if I should say it, but it felt like a bit of an orgasm for me at the time. <laughs> Pass the watershed, yeah, right. <laughs> it felt like an orgasm. <laughs> I think we want to know more about that. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, you know, the excitement, the adrenaline of a deal, I think really from a very early age, when you get somebody who says they want to buy it and you make a profit, just that excitement of a deal for me has never left me since the age of 12. Now, you mentioned your father. He was a, he was a great inspiration for you. Wasn't Sorry, he? I'm just getting a bit embarrassed because I said the word orgasm and I had my daughter sitting in the audience give me a dirty look, saying, can, wait till I tell mum. I can promise you, <laughs> you're not as embarrassed as she is. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> um, Sorry. Yes, your father. He was oh, a great yes. inspiration. I um, now, when I started out in business, because my father ran his own business, and, and I suppose as a child growing up, I watched my father at work, and I was always very inspired by his drive, his determination, and his sheer commitment to wanting to be successful in business. And I realized then that to be successful, it was gonna be no easy, mean feast, you know, to be able to do that. And literally, he was so driven, so motivated, and that sort of DNA has never really left me. I said, ever since watching him, and, and even when I wrote my autobiography, and I finished writing the book, and I reflected back and said, you know, who has been probably the most influential or inspirational person for me, you know, through my journey. The only person I could think of was Dad, so I actually dedicated my autobiography to my father. Now, there's a, a nice quote that he passed down to you. He said, to, he said that business is not about good transactions, but about good relationships. How have you kind of taken that mantra forward with you into your business life? In what way do you kind of try and live by that in a way? I mean, it's really interesting because it sounds so simple, it sounds so easy, but the philosophy to me of everybody that, that's a very successful entrepreneur, I think everybody believes you have to be ruthless, you have to be aggressive, and you've got to tread on people. But my father was quite a philosophical person and recognized that business isn't actually about that. Business is about developing a relationship where you want to be able to do business with that person again, whereas I think a transaction is where you're driven to win but what my father used to tell me was, when you're driven by winning, that means somebody else has to lose, and therefore business doesn't consistently build on that basis. So he was always very focused on 
what we used to call a win-win formula, where in a relationship, in business, both people have to win. And even when I went on to Dragon's Den, I remember watching the show myself and sometimes cringing when, you know, Peter would be quite aggressive with somebody or Duncan would kind of wrap up their idea and throw it at them. And I used to say to myself, I'm not sure you should treat people like that. And, you know, I suppose the upbringing from my father and the, the principles that he had really shared with me, that it's about building those relationships. So, you know, even when somebody came into Dragon's Den with a crazy idea that I wouldn't want to invest in, it didn't mean I had to belittle the person. What I could say was, look, you know what, it's a great idea, it's probably not for me, but I wish you every success, because I think we have a responsibility on that show to inspire people, because one of the things that I've learned very early on in life is as an entrepreneur, your first idea doesn't have to be your best idea. And just because you come onto Dragons then and the idea isn't necessarily right, we should still give them the encouragement to want to continue. But if you criticize them, if you belittle them, they walk off the show thinking, this is not for me. And who knows, that could be potentially somebody who could have been very successful. So that principle of building that relationship, even if it's for seven minutes on a TV show, you know, I still find that there's, it doesn't cost anything to be polite. So for me, that's a very important principle of business. Um, how did you take, or how did your father take the fact that you didn't want to be in business with him at 16 when you just said, I'm going out on my own. How did he handle um, that? I think the only phrase I could think of is I probably broke his heart because like any father, especially within an Asian family, the concept of family business is so important within our community. So when he built that business, there was no question in his mind that he would love to see you know, his sons entering into the business. So when I said, Dad, it's not really for me, I mean, he was absolutely devastated. Him and I fell out really badly. Um, and, you know, for like three days, he didn't speak to me. I didn't speak to him. And eventually, I found the tension so, so strong that I eventually left home because I thought, you know, he's never going to forgive me. And then having left home, I then decided I'm going to leave school too. So at the age of 16, my mother, who was heartbroken seeing her son having to leave home, she had 30 pounds that she'd saved up for me. And essentially, I left home with that 30 quid. Uh, and actually, if I'm really honest, I thought I'd be back in two weeks' time thinking, you know, I'll throw the toys out the pram, you know, I'll, I'll get it off my system. But of course, at 30 quid, it isn't going to last very long. I would come home. But having left and made that decision, because I remember what happened on that day, I'd left the house and I was walking down the street and I was literally in tears. I was crying because I was praying that either my father or one of my brothers would run after me and say, don't be stupid, come back. And I walked so slowly to the station thinking somebody would come after me, but nobody did. And actually, by the time I got to the train station, I realized I have to show these people that, you know what, I can do this. Because my father said that I was mollycoddle and I was spoilt and, you know, that I, I couldn't make it and I didn't have what it took. And by the time I got to the train station, I thought, you know, you had the opportunity. You could have called me back. You didn't. Now leave it up to me. I'm going to prove that I can do this. And, you know, two years went by and I didn't go home. I didn't speak to my father. I was really proud. He was extremely proud. But at the end of two years, I'd managed to start my own business. And, you know, I was dying to show him uh, that the business was going to do well. But my father didn't understand what recruitment and headhunting really meant. He thought it was a crazy business that would never make it because why would anybody pay you a fee to hire somebody who could leave? And it was only when the company that I set up, Humana International, uh, we grew to 100 offices, and we had this huge launch at the Dorchester Hotel, and we were doing a presentation like this, and we had this slide on the wall, and we had this world map, and we had these 100 offices and these flags on the wall. And I remember making a presentation in the audience. My father was standing there with tears in his eyes because I don't think he ever believed that I would ever make it to that level. And as I came off the stage, he came over and embraced me and said, I'm so proud of you. And you know, it was really amazing. That one second, those words meant more to me than all the success that I could have created. Because I think as a child, the one thing you crave for is that acceptance of your parents. And when he said that to me, for me, that was the point I knew I'd arrived. And it wasn't when I hit this rich list in the Sunday Times. I'm not surprised. Clearly. Um you mentioned uh, a minute ago about it's important to let people fail in a way in, in Dragon's Den and things like that. 
it's, you said that it took you nearly two years to really make a success of the first business, starting in a cupboard and, and building it up. Did you doubt at any point that you were going to make it? Did you think, I've made a horrible mistake, I need to go home and clear things over with my father? Or did you just think, you know what, it, somehow, somewhere along the line, success will find me? Um, I didn't believe um, at any point in my journey that I would ever make it. And I think the one thing that every entrepreneur that I've met who's successful, there's no question that the one common ingredient is I think we all have the fear of failure. So, you know, I remember watching a presentation at, at a conference where, you know, Bill Gates was standing up talking and somebody asked the same question. You know, and, and Bill Gates is the richest man in the world standing there saying, you know, when we started Microsoft, one of the biggest problems we had is I couldn't get a company car for the first salesman I hired because the leasing company said, I've never heard of you, you have no track record, this thing will never make it. And he had to get a friend of his to guarantee the lease on a company car. So I think when you start out, I don't believe anybody really knows whether they'll actually make it or not. And every day when I was in that broom cupboard, all I knew was I couldn't fail and somehow I had to keep trying. And, and the thing, I suppose, the secret for me was the motivation wasn't about being successful or being wealthy, but I think entrepreneurs need bite-sized objectives. So when I was in that little broom cupboard, the only thing that was really frustrating me is that that room didn't have a window. And I just felt quite lonely, because every day you walk into this room, it's just a box, there's a desk, a phone, another chair. And I thought, if I make my first sale, the one thing I'd love to do is have an office with a window, and that was the motivation. And then when I made my first transaction and we got an office that had a window, the next objective was, you know, being an entrepreneur is quite lonely because every day I come in, I'm just on my own, I'm picking up the phone, I make a sale, I want to tell somebody, you know, and the cleaner doesn't come in till 7.30 and I've got to wait all day to tell her that I've just had a great day. So the next objective was, let me hire one person and then it's a second. So I think in my entire journey, there's never really been that sort of global goal all it's been is one day at a time to say, could I get through this day, through this week, through this month, and get to that next level? But did you have the same fear when you set up the second business? Because the first, as I said here, you know, hundreds of countries made millions of pounds, and you took a different turn and set up Hamilton Bradshaw. Did you get the same feeling in your stomach, thinking, can I do this? Have I made a mistake? Or do you, after you've done it once, do you think, it's fine, I'll do it again? No, Hamilton Bradshaw was different because Alexander Mann was a recruitment firm that I knew and I understood. When I set up Hamilton Bradshaw, the private equity firm, I'm not an investment banker. I'm not an investment analyst. I've never done it before. It was a brand new business, a brand new industry. And, you know, I didn't know for one second whether it would work. Because here, I'm not running businesses. I'm buying businesses. And I remember we, we invested in a business called Benji's, which was a a national sandwich chain. And when I bought this company, it was losing 100,000 pounds a week. And for some reason, I believe I could turn this business around because I thought, you know, I, I'm a good entrepreneur. I know what I'm doing. But actually, I invested in this business. I paid a fortune to buy it. And then I was funding it every week to cover the losses. And literally six months went by and I poured millions of pounds into this business and I just couldn't turn it around. And interesting enough for me, it was probably one of the most important lessons I learned because sometimes what happens is if you keep becoming successful, you become complacent and sometimes you think you can do anything. And that business really taught me a great lesson. Stick to what you know best. You're not in the sandwich business. It's not a market you understand. It's not a sector I've been in. And the best decision I made was when I woke up one morning and said, I've got to cut my losses. My first loss is my best loss because I'd probably spent three million pounds. Every week I'd go to the cash point, take a hundred grand out, put it into the business, and then I lose it again the following week. So sometimes I think the best lesson you learn as an entrepreneur is when you fail. And I think, you know, one of the books that I'm writing at the moment is actually focusing on the principle of actually, as an entrepreneur, you need to understand how you accept failure. Because every entrepreneur, every TV program, every book I've ever read, all it ever talks about is how to be successful. The problem is, failure is part of success. The journey to success, you have to learn how to fail. And unless you've learned how to do that, I'm not sure you'll ever really make it. So to me, recognizing 
that not everything works the way you think, and how to embrace that, I think, is very important. Now, I'm always fascinated when I read biographies of people like you and, and, and interviews about what, how your day works, what you do in a typical day. And I'm sure you'll tell me there's no such thing as a typical day. But if there was, what would you be doing? What, how does the day form for you? Sadly for me, my day, unfortunately, is quite ridiculous because I, today, manage over 40 companies. So if you imagine, I have 40 chief executives reporting to me. I receive about 1,000 emails a day. I have a team of 35 people who look after my activities, who work for me in my offices. So I normally kick off at around 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm up at 6, and between 6.30 and 8, I'm checking my emails, I'm reviewing the documents, because during the day, I have meetings on average every hour on the hour. So I see on average 12 people a day. If I'm traveling and my travel time to my next appointment is 45 minutes, I have three conference calls every 15 minutes. So my office will patch me into a call because I don't actually have time to return calls. So the only way I can return a call is if I'm traveling in between appointments every 15 minutes. So my time or my day is in 15-minute bite slots. Unfortunately, my diary is booked generally five to six months in advance. So I could tell you now, in September, on Thursday, between three and four, I'm probably not available. So it's actually quite sad because, you know, my daughter sitting here who will tell you um, that if she needs to see me or we want to go out for dinner, sadly, she calls the office, speaks to my office, books a slot in the diary on a Wednesday evening, because, unfortunately, the chances of me being available in any given evening, it's just, it's just not possible. So I have very clear slots for Gemma. I have a slot for Hannah. I have a slot for my wife. I also have two cats, Coco and Tinkerbell. I have actually them in my yeah, diary. <laughs> no, so it's really sad. You said you've got 40 CEOs speaking to you on a regular basis, looking to you for advice. Who do you turn to for advice? My two cats. <laughs> What do they say? <laughs> Meow. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fair enough. No, um, I tell you what I do. When I need advice, I download my app. I go to the relevant section on James Khan's Business Secrets, and that's where I get the advice. <laughs> We're getting there. We'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> you, you can't help me. I had to give it a quick plug. We do, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Don't worry. Um, we must, of course, talk about Dragons Then. Really? Apparently so. Um, were you nervous in any way coming into an existing show which was so popular? Because in a way, I suppose it's like, it's like a job audition or interview, more accurately, in front of millions of people. How did you deal with that kind of... I mean, it was fear? really interesting because it's amazing how wrong you can be. When uh, I was offered the slot on Dragon's Den, because I invest in businesses for a living, I just assumed it would be really easy because I thought, I'd do this anyway, I'm going to go on the show, I'm going to meet people, I'm going to invest in them. It should be a walk in the park. The one mistake I made, and the thing that I didn't realize, was for some strange reason, I thought, when you go into Dragon's Den in the morning, the producer gives you like a pack. So here's all the business plans, here's the CVs, etc. So you get a chance to review them, read them, and understand them, so you know what questions to ask. On the day, the first day I arrive on the show, Literally, you arrive 10 minutes in makeup, you go to the studio, next thing, you're sitting on the panel, and the guy walks up the stairs. So I'm looking at everybody thinking, where's the pack? So I nudge Duncan and say, Duncan, where's the pack? He said, no packs here. So I said, seriously, you can't, you can't be so You don't really, you don't just sit here and a guy walks up the stairs, you listen to him for 20 minutes, and you write him a check for 100 grand. He said, welcome to Dragon's Den. So I'm looking at these guys and say, what a bunch of Muppets. I mean, this is like real money, this is real cash, and that's all they do. So anyway, this is absolutely true story. So I sat there literally for five days. I couldn't make an investment because I'm so used to meeting people for six or seven times. I analyze their business, I get a researcher, we do market due diligence, we understand the product. It takes like three months. These Muppets do it literally in 20 minutes. So, couldn't make an investment. Anyway, on the fifth day, on the Friday, I'm getting dressed in the morning, and my wife says to me, darling, how's it going on the show? I said, actually, not great. She said, why is that? I thought this was so easy for you. I thought you'd be so natural at it. I said, I'll tell you the problem. You literally, you, you turn up at this show, 
You sit there, this guy walks up the stairs that you've never met, you have no information, you have no idea, and they expect you to write a check. She says, sweetheart, please, this is national television. What will the neighbors think if you sit there and you can't make an investment? Our whole family is going to be watching this show. Surely you can't sit there and not do a deal. And actually, I thought to myself, she's right. I wasn't thinking about the family. I wasn't thinking about the neighbors. I was more thinking about losing 100 grand. But clearly, she's got a point. So as I'm driving that day to Pinewood Studios, I come up with a strategy. I decide today I'm going to make my first investment. So I've got a plan. I've got a very focused approach. The answer is really simple. The first person who walks through that door on Friday morning, I'm going to put my hand up and say, I'm in. And ladies and gentlemen, that was the dog treadmill. That was my first investment. And what did you learn about yourself, apart from the fact you like dog treadmills? We're what? now inventing the cat treadmill. <laughs> I, I can't wait. And nor can your cat, no doubt. Clearly. <laughs> um, what did you learn about yourself from that show? Because that was very different, a different environment, a different kind of skill set needed. What did you take away from your four years there? Um, one of the things that I found really difficult is when I'm investing as Hamilton Bradshaw, I'm not really competing because, you know, the investment comes into me and I look at it and we make a decision. Here, when you're making an investment, it's so competitive because clearly, you know, Peter's got his angle, Deborah's got hers, Duncan's got his. And not only are you trying to work out the investment and understand, does that make sense? But from the corner of your eye, you're also looking to see, where's Peter coming from? Will he make an offer? Is Duncan going to undercut me? You know, is Theo going to remind me about his children's inheritance? You know, it's actually quite a competitive environment. And I think the other thing that, that, that's quite knowledgeable in Dragon's Den is what happens is in your normal day job, so, you know, in the UK, I'm probably Mr. Recruitment, but all of a sudden here, I've got to know about an investment where some guy's built a garden shed, you know, that automatically turns around, or somebody's got a tricycle that's got a cucumber holder on there, or somebody's got a yellow submarine that, you know, he wants to sell for a million quid. So the thing that I learned was that actually you've got to know and understand every conceivable business, every industry that you've got to be able to ask intelligent questions because, you know, you've got six million people watching that show and you have somebody standing in front of you. And I remember uh, there was a couple who came on Dragon's Den and, you know, they looked quite normal. They were quite sane. They certainly looked like they were from planet Earth. And she's come up with this new invention where she explains how in Britain today, all married couples suffer from this problem where either the man spends too much time on the wife's side of the bed or the wife's on the man's side of the bed. And she felt that she'd invented a cure for that problem, which was a bed sheet with a black line in the middle, which would keep the couple apart. Now you imagine you're sitting there and you're thinking, what question do you ask, you know, that inventor? Because six million people are watching this show, and I'm thinking, she can't be serious. Surely this is not all this investment is. And so it came to my turn to ask a question. So I said, would you mind if I came and had a look at the bed sheet? Because of course I'm thinking, maybe it vibrates, or maybe there's something in the line. So I pick up the sheet, and I rub it, as you would. And ladies and gentlemen, it really was just a black line. It was a white sheet with a black line, and she wanted a £100,000 investment for 20% equity. So the only question I could think of was, how long did it take you to invent this? Clearly being very sarcastic. And she very normally says, two years. I thought, OK. And then all the dragons are looking at me thinking, and, and the next question is, so I said, oh, uh, and, 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 and how many have you sold? She said, three. I said, fantastic. And who bought them? She said, mum bought one, my sister bought one, and my brother in Australia has ordered one. So I said, and for those reasons, I'm out. <laughs> well, she obviously didn't have too many skills of an uh, entrepreneur. What skills do you say an entrepreneur needs? Because apart from ability to promote their own apps, which will get clearly, to you, yeah, <laughs> um, some people have got it, and clearly some people haven't. What can you tell our friends here that uh, you need to have in order to make it in business? I think the best advice I can give any of you, really, if you want to know how to succeed in business, is download the James Carnes Business Secrets app, which is available. <laughs> it's all in the app. <laughs> well, let's talk about apps, then, shall we? Um, how do you see things like social media and, and social networks changing business? Because 
There was a time, I can remember not so long ago, when Facebook just started, Twitter just started, that businesses used to say you're not allowed to touch it during work hours. You can't, if you're seen going on Facebook, you're out. Now it's come very much full circle and businesses are flooding to Twitter, flooding to Facebook. What's changed? I mean, I think for businesses, I think social media is probably today the most powerful form of marketing. When I started in business, I remember Alexander Mann, we used to have a budget of around a million pounds a year to promote and market the business. Today, if I added up the 40 companies I own today, we don't spend a million pounds on marketing. There lies the answer. The way we can communicate today using social media is so much more powerful because it's so targeted. When I started a business, essentially advertising to me was like spray and pray. You know, you throw it out there and you hope somebody's going to read it. The, the impact on social media today means you can actually target directly the consumer you want to speak to. So to me, I think there is no question that it has revolutionized the way businesses are done today. I think with the advent of social media, I mean, if you look at Facebook today, if that was a country, it would be the fifth largest country in the world, and that is the audience you could market to. So there's no question, I think social media is a fundamental part of any business strategy. So let's talk about the app. James has done an app, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I don't really? know if you knew this. Oh, wow. Oh, there it is, look. Uh, why an app and why now? Um, one of the reasons, I mean, I, because of Dragon's Den, as you can imagine, I get approached so often my website gets nearly 400,000 hits a month. And there are so many people consistently looking for advice, looking for ideas, and constantly approaching me about business challenges. And, you know, I was trying to find a way, how can I help young entrepreneurs to give them advice? Because I know when I was starting out in that journey, it is a very tough journey. It's quite a lonely life. What can I do to share some of that experience that I gained over the last 25 years? And to me, the app was probably the most effective and simple way of doing that. When we were building the app, you know, we spent ages debating, you know, should we charge for it? How much should we charge? And to me, this was not a money-making exercise. This was me really trying to share some of that journey, some of that experience with people who I genuinely feel could make a difference from it. And I know that I was fortunate enough where I had a father who mentored me, but so many entrepreneurs that I meet don't have that a, a mentor. And to me, this was an opportunity to give young entrepreneurs or established businesses James Khan literally in their pocket 24-7. And who wouldn't want that? Clearly. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, is it only for entrepreneurs and people launching businesses? If I don't have my own business, is it going to be useful to me? Is there stuff in it that I can use in, in my career or in any career, do you think? I mean, it's really interesting. We, we get a lot of feedback on the app. And there's somebody who, who's got a business turning over 160 million pounds a year um, who wrote to me recently saying, that it's quite amazing that even though he thought he was such a successful businessman with an amazing business, that he found some of the specific advice so practical because one of the areas that I talk about a lot is how do you attract good people into your business? Because business really is only as good as the people you attract. And because I've spent so much of my time focusing on attracting people into businesses, it's my probably my most focused area. And the app today, I think that section gets more downloads in any other section. So I think the apps for people who are inspired about being in business, who are existing businesses, or who want to start businesses, or people who want to raise capital, people who want to, I mean, there's a woman actually approached me because one of the sections on the app is how do you manage your finances? And there's a lady who's actually a housewife, you know, who found that section so valuable. So really, I think it's for anyone who's interested in enterprise or about being an entrepreneur, really. Fine. I think we have a, a bit of video, actually, about um, employing people. You talked about getting staff, so can we run that one? People transform businesses, whether you're an SME, whether you're a small-sized business, a startup, or a multinational, people make a difference. The question is, when securing or finding that right person, what have you actually done? Have you spoken to people in your organization to get referrals or recommendations? Have you even considered giving a bounty to those people? What about people you know, friends or family? What about employment agencies, specialist niche market agencies who can identify the right people for you? The online community today has a variety of job boards who specialize in your particular sector. What about newspapers advertising the job? 
the key is to make sure that you try every different method available in getting that right person. Next, what about remuneration? Have you designed a remuneration that's going to attract the right person? Is the remuneration that you've designed, is it going to influence the behavior you're looking for? Thirdly, how do you keep those right people? What is the career path that you're going to communicate to that individual that's going to aspire and motivate him to stay with your organization? Do you have regular appraisals, reviews to ensure that he's kept motivated and incentivized? These are some of the ideas that I think are going to be really important when attracting the right people. I, I found the, the section about staff really interesting because um, working in somewhere like a newspaper, it's obviously a lot of about dealing with people and interacting with people. There was a section or a, a bit that you said which I found very intriguing. Um, induction conversations. When you employ somebody, one of the things you said, you give everybody in the team a one-pager about this new member of staff so they have stuff to talk about, so they can feel comfortable and you know, they know people there. I couldn't work out whether that was terrifying or, or would make things easier. Well, how did you come across that idea and how does it work? I think that, um, to me, when you're employing people, the induction is the most valuable part of a journey when you join an organization. And I've seen lots and lots of people, when they join an organization, they start on Monday, and they really feel a bit of an outsider. To me, I put a lot of focus. So if, for the sake of argument, I'm going to induct an individual, he's joined the company, and he's going to see the finance person. The problem is, what question will he ask them? So what they really do is they have what I call a nice chat that gets nowhere. So what I do is I actually design the questions myself and say, because of course I know my finance director, so I'll say, ask him about this particular transaction we did two years ago, because all of a sudden you'll engage in a much more meaningful conversation. I want that new employee to feel part of the organization as quick as possible. I also know that when that particular finance director joined the company, in the first three months he found one particular section of the business really challenging. Now, he would never have known that, so I actually introduced that question. So every single employee that he's going to meet, we actually give the questions to the new person joining the company. But I do the same in reverse. I give questions because, of course, I've interviewed this person. I've offered them a job, and I know why I've offered him the job. I give those questions to my staff and say, when you meet this new employee, these are the questions that I think you should ask to get to know him. Because I want somebody to... I want both sides to walk away with something tangible. In fact, I think one of our new employees is standing there, Elliot, who's just joined, who in fact is going through his induction as we speak. If staff are the kind of the lifeblood of the company, any successful company obviously has to make money and has to keep an eye on the books. Uh, we have a, another video when you were talking about uh, keeping hold of the finances. Can we play the, the second clip? Raising money is the key catalyst to starting any business. So the question is, who have you targeted looking to raise that capital? It's not just the banks that are lending money. What about family and friends? What about business communities? What about angel networks, venture capital firms, private equity firms? Even the government today are looking at various schemes to help entrepreneurship. So knowing who to target as the audience is absolutely key. Secondly, what have you done in terms of establishing how much money you're going to require? How well is that business plan being designed? What is that key sort of peak cash requirement that the business is going to need? Next, what about what you're going to spend the money on? How eloquently are you able to communicate how that money is going to be spent? Every investor absolutely wants to know how well that money has been phased into the business. The question in all of these issues is knowing your numbers make sure that you understand and you are well rehearsed on how that money is going to be spent, how much equity you require. The equity component is obviously very important. This will be your key negotiation during the process. Making sure that you understand how much equity you need for the capital you require is absolutely key. Now, you talked about numbers. The app's done extremely well since it launched. You, how many downloads has it had, do you know? Um, when we built the app, we were told that we would expect uh, something of this type. We should be aiming to get about 5,000 downloads a week. Um, and it clearly shows I don't know my numbers very well because we've had just over 20,000 downloads a week. And I think we're just at around 80,000 people have downloaded the app already. So 
it's, it's kind of gone way beyond any expectation that I had. But that sort of tells me that clearly there is a, a genuine need out there where I think people really value it. And I think the fact that it's free, I think most of the feedback that we get is I think a lot of people are quite surprised that because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a businessman, that anything I do, you naturally assume there would have to be a profit involved. And the fact that I've invested in the app and I've not charged anything, I think has gone down extremely well. Well, when you hear those numbers, you must slightly regret that you weren't charging for it. Well, you know, when you think about it, even if I charged three pounds, I would have made a quarter of a million pounds by now in the last three weeks. And, you know, I'm actually short of a bit of cash right now, so it would have been quite handy. We can have a whip round later. There's Please. Been, there'll be a hat. <laughs> um, what's the next big growth market, do you think? Where, where should we be putting our money? You talk about... Um, have to have a firm grip, so where, where, should we, uh, where should we be investing at the moment? I think to me right now, the biggest sector, if you want to be in business, is the e-commerce sector where you are exporting goods and services online. Just to test the market, anybody raise their hand if they can think, what do you think Britain today exports in relation to e-commerce? So this is where people sell goods and services online, they export to other countries. How much money do you think is generated by the UK economy through online sales? Anybody got a figure? Pick a number. How big do you think that market is? No ideas? OK, let me tell you. UK PLC today generates £100 billion a year on online sales through e-commerce. If that was a sector, if that was an industry, it would be the largest industry in this country. It would be bigger than financial services, the motor industry, the retail industry. 100 billion is what the UK stands for. It represents nearly 7% of GDP. And Britain today is the most successful country in the whole of Europe in that particular space. The interesting thing is nobody knows about it. Nobody quite realizes how big that market has become today. But if you look at virtually every single business today, they are creating an online platform to generate revenue for their goods and services. And nobody, you know, we, we were at a huge conference recently, and, you know, some of the financial analysts who were in the room didn't even realize that Britain's number one in that particular space. So if I was investing today, I think e-commerce and online platforms, there is no question that is where the market really is today. And what is next for you? What, what's your next kind of venture? Um, you know, I, I spend right now probably two days a week running my private equity business. I spend two days a week in marketing-related activities, things like the app or the book or TV shows. And I spend two days a week on the James Caan Foundation, where we're building homes for deprived people, educating poor children, affecting flood victims in places like Pakistan. You know, as you probably know, I'm the chairman of the big issue where we're looking after the homeless in this country. And that sort of side of my life is taking up probably more and more of my time. And I must admit, I, I get so much more motivation, so much more inspiration in those type of activities. A few years ago, I built a, a school in Pakistan in a village where they had no school. And there were 600 children who'd never been to school before. And the James Khan Foundation built an entire education campus for them. And I was there last week meeting some of the kids. And, you know, when I spend time in some of those areas, it's quite amazing that the inspiration, the motivation that you get when you see other people doing well or you're giving somebody a chance that they would never have is, is, a, is an experience that I think no business could ever do. So I think for me, if I look over the next five or ten years, I can probably imagine spending more and more time on some of those activities because ultimately I think what we do in life every day, we do the things that inspire and motivate us the most. And although I think, you know, it'd be great to do another deal or make another 100,000 or a million pounds, the problem is you can only, as you can see, you can only wear one suit, and clearly I only have the one suit. You know, I would rather do things that I think give me something back and allow me to share in some of that experience. So I think, for me, the next five or ten years, I think the James Khan Foundation is probably going to represent more of the life that I spend. Well, I think that's a good time to open up some questions to the floor. So if you want to put your hand up, if you have anything you'd like to ask James about anything we've talked about or anything else, I think we have some people with some microphones that might make their way to you. Let's 
start the gentleman in the suit just there. I think he was the first. Yep, you, looking behind there. Yes, you, sir. Um, there's a young lady about to give you a mic. Hi, James. Hi, James. Um, I work in business innovation for a recruitment firm. Obviously, a subject oh, really? that's uh, quite close to your heart. And, uh, Do we have a copy of your CV? Uh, I sent it to you on LinkedIn <laughs> the other day, actually. But anyway, one of your 35 people in your office may have picked it up and put it in the bin. Um, and uh, in this particular market, in tough economic times, uh, I'm struggling with my company to try and um, create change and to try and promote change within an organisation because it's always a thought to buckle down when times are tough. But what are your thoughts on that? And what are your tips for facilitating change in an organisation when the market is difficult? Which sector of the recruitment industry are you in? Uh, pre predominantly the public sector. OK, which is a very tough market right now because of the government cutbacks. I mean, we, we also have a business that operates in the public sector, and the business, I think, turns over nearly £100 million a year, where we essentially outsource recruitment from government sectors. And that market, we are absolutely finding quite challenging. But I think the, the, the key issue is, you are in the recruitment business. There are other sectors. You know, what we've done in that particular business is move into sectors that where we think the business is far more buoyant. And interestingly enough, one of the new areas that we're developing is media, marketing, and online digital. Because at the end of the day, the skills of finding candidates, working for employers, arranging interviews are the same. And actually, I think in sectors where we see the market declining, the answer to me is to go into sectors that are actually on the up. So I think it's really about recognizing where that next big market opportunity is. And I think my own view is public sector is going to be quite difficult, not just this month, probably for the next election, the next four years, where the government's commitment to cut costs so radically means that people in the recruitment market will find it difficult. OK. Anybody else? There are some hands over here. Young lady in the front row. I'm a new user of uh, the Apple Store, and so I'm interested in apps. And you told us how much um, it, you could make from the app. How much did it cost you to, to develop the app? Um, mine was actually quite expensive because it took quite a long time because we had to produce, I think, eight or nine videos. We had to do it on location. Um, I spent ages in the studio recording the playlist, etc. But I think we spent nearly £40,000 on production. There's a surprising amount of, of content actually on the app, isn't there? Yeah. Because there's, there's the stuff that we've seen here, but there's also your autobiography, yeah. uh, spoken word autobiography. Why did you choose to put that on there as well, as an added extra, I suppose? Um, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, I, I'm very passionate about every time you produce something, I think people want to maximize value, you know, when they either receive a product. And just because it was free, I didn't, I didn't compromise on what I was producing, because fundamentally, the app was my brand, and I remember my publisher nearly fell off my chair when I, when I said, actually, you know, I'd like to give the autobiography, which you can get on iTunes for $7.95, which is still available on iTunes, and yet I'm giving it free on the app. But to me, I wanted to give something and share something back with the people, you know, and because the book was such a big seller, I wanted to make the most of the opportunity that people have, because actually, if you look at the app at $2.95 and the book at £7, it's a £10 product that actually I'm giving for free. And you know, also I think it was important because just because you're successful or you made money, you know, I don't think everything you do in life is about making money. If you have an opportunity where you can share something and give somebody something that maybe will be valuable to them, to me that's just as important. So actually throwing the, the autobiography in as free was to me just another way of giving something back. Fine. Uh, any more questions? Gentleman at the back, and then we'll come to you, sir, in the front. Can we? Sorry, I've got to making you walk all the way around again. Do you want to keep your hand up, sir, at the back, so that we can find you? Oh, hello, my name is James as well. Um, I'm actually an online entrepreneur, and I wanted to ask you what the next, what do you think the next big thing is regarding online media? Uh, the next big thing for an online entrepreneur to invest in. I mean, there are so many, I mean, you know, I was reading on the way down here, there's been something like 14 billion apps which have been downloaded in the last two years. And when you compare, in the last 10 years, 15 billion songs were downloaded. So if you just compare that, in two years, we've almost downloaded more apps in two years 
than the number of physical songs we download over a 10 year period. You know, so I think the market is just so wide open. You know, everybody has a, a passion on a particular idea. And imagine the different types of apps that are available. There are people making money. So I think the business that you go into ultimately is very much about you and your passion. I don't think business is where you take an idea from somebody else. I think it's got to be an idea that you believe in. I think any entrepreneur who's successful is because they are passionate about something that they believe in. You know, and I think if the online market, it's really recognizing or identifying which sector is really you. You know, like recruitment was very much about me, my personality, and what I believed in. I, I couldn't be a retailer because that wouldn't really suit me. So I would say, if that's your particular sector, it's finding something that you can identify with. But clearly, the market is absolutely massive. I mean, I was shocked myself to think that you know, something like 14 billion apps have been downloaded. I mean, who would have thought there are more apps downloaded today than there are songs? Thank you, James. Um, there's a gentleman down here, please. Thank you. Um, I'm a student studying entrepreneurship right now, and I was wondering, even though if you have ideas, you need to find an investor for it. So what are some advice that you can give us about finding investors, and how do you find your first investor when you start your company when you're 16? That's a really good question, because raising capital is the first section on James Kahn's Business Secrets, which is available on app right now. Um, so all that specific advice is absolutely there, and you'll find you know, I take you right through the journey of what you do, how you do it, where you go. Um, you know, when I was starting out, there wasn't the community available. There wasn't a venture capital market. There was no angel investors. There was no internet. So for me, it was impossible to get any money. You know, so essentially, when I started my business, I did it on a credit card. I used the access credit available to me on my credit card because I knew that was the only way I could raise any money. But today, I think the market's far more sophisticated. And the one thing I will say to you is, if you do have a good idea, you can attract capital. There are people out there, I mean, to give you an idea, people say the banks are not lending. I'm on the government panel for small businesses, and we met with all the high street banks two weeks ago, and I asked each one of them exactly how much money they were lending to SMEs, and I wrote it down. On average right now, the banks are actually lending 2.2 billion pounds a month. Their projection this year is 27 billion pounds. So that tells me there are people out there getting capital. So if the product is good, you will be surprised there, are, there is capital available. The problem is the banks clearly are not going to lend to something they don't believe in. So providing you can demonstrate to somebody what the viability of your proposition is, that it can generate capital, it can generate cash, and you can service that loan, I actually believe there is capital out there to be had. OK, we've got time for one more question. So. Anyone got one last question? Lady there. The microphone's coming on your left shoulder. There we are. Hi. Um, what's the like one or two do's or don'ts um, for um, starting up a business? Do's and don'ts in starting out a business. I mean, I suppose the one thing that I've learned is a lot of entrepreneurs, they think they've got to think of the next great big idea. Virtually, there's not a day that passes by that somebody approaches me and says, you know, what's the next big idea? What do I need to do to become a successful entrepreneur? And to me, one of the things that I've learned, it's not about being original. It's not about coming up with the next big idea. Because actually, how even, I couldn't even do that. I think to me, one of the ways to be an entrepreneur, an easy way to do it, is not necessarily come up with an idea that's different but look at something that already exists. So let me give you a, a simple example. If you take EasyJet as, a, as an idea, as a business, the airline industry already existed. People flew planes, travel existed. There was actually nothing unique in the concept. What Stelios did was took an existing idea and said, could I make that better, easier, or cheaper? And I think so many ideas where people become incredibly successful isn't because they've originated something new, what they've done is they've taken an existing idea and made it faster, cheaper, better. And to me, as an investor, I'm always likely to invest in something like that because one of the dangers when you invent something completely new, the problem is you're creating change. You have to educate a market that probably isn't familiar with your idea. Whereas if you take an existing concept and you modify it, 
What you don't have is that investment of educating an entire market. So one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is look at something that already exists and see whether you can make it better, faster or cheaper, and therefore you'll find you'll get an investment a lot quicker. There we are. Well, that's all we have time for. Um, James's app, I'm sure you won't mind me mentioning, is available to download from the App Store. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Carr.